this a character that you love? Start with that. How excited are you about this? Because that's something that if you're feeling insecure, like it should be a character that can kind of build you up again. Just like the skill level, right? Of being like, my costume looks like shit because my mom helped me make it versus that guy over there who 3D printed his armor. You need to know that it is like with any skill or hobby, something that takes time to grow and learn the abilities to be able to do that. Because that guy with the 3D printed armor, he probably also started with the cardboard costume that his mom helped him make. Go up and talk to him. And they're usually really encouraging. So if you were like, hey, how do I get to be that guy? Talk to these people, they keep going at it. It's only gonna get better. Hello and welcome back to Care So Much. Thank you all so much for being here today. I am particularly excited about today's guest because she is a, actually a very close friend of mine. Uh, her name is Piper Cleveland, and she is just a creator of all kinds. She's the, one of the most creative people I know personally, and you can see that in the list of amazing things that she does. She is a podcaster. She is the co-host of a podcast called World Forge. And she is also a podcast host of um, a podcast called Air Buds, which I know fairly well as I am the other co-host on that one. She is an artist, a writer, and she is here today to talk to us about one of her favorite creative endeavors, which is cosplay. So without further ado, Piper, would you tell the audience a little bit about you and why you want to talk about cosplay today? Hi, Lillian. Hi, Lillian's listeners. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thank you for having me and letting me come kind of gush about this because, yeah, when, when I first heard that you were doing this show, I was automatically excited and I wanted to be able to contribute in some way. And I thought about it and, uh, you know, cosplaying is is the thing that I was really excited to talk about, I think, because of the creative things that I do. Like, I think I, I share my art all the time. I'm always excited to talk about my writing, but I think cosplay is something that's a little less well known. And so therefore I thought maybe it'd be fun to kind of share how I got into it, what it means to me. And I think, uh, you know, how awesome it is for anyone who like me before cosplay kind of has an itch to be creative and find a way to express their self in, in this wonderful format. So I'm happy to talk to you all about it today. For some people who maybe have sort of stumbled in here and are vaguely aware of sort of the idea of it, or maybe somebody who this is the very first time they're hearing the word, mm -hmm. what is cosplay? I would describe cosplay as a creative hobby. And it's essentially, what if Halloween, but anytime you want. It's mostly the dressing up as a certain character. And typically it is almost always a fictional character. One thing I love about cosplay is that the definition is so broad. There aren't a lot of rules to it. So I tend to like to make my costumes, but that's not a requirement of the hobby. You can be someone who 100% buys all the parts for it. Or you could even buy a cosplay pre-made or commission someone to make a cosplay for you. Where it is defined really is that you are dressing up or paying homage to a character. If we break down the word, the play part of it uh, is an element that I think traditionally, because I believe this started in Japan, it involved a pretty heavy role play element. That is not always required, of course. You can simply, like I do, uh, create a costume, wear it to an event, which is usually like a fan convention that I attend, and then just hang out and just be in costume and have fun. So that's the gist of it uh, <laughs> as a start. And I think that that's such a helpful definition and the idea that it's this, you're dressing up in costume, right? Do you feel like there's a line where it's just dressing up nice to go out versus you're trying to put out a particular aesthetic versus you're trying to be a particular character. Like how would you define the difference between generically dressing up as a witch mm -hmm. versus dressing up as the Joker? That really depends on the individual. And that will probably be a lot of kind of how my answers begin on this interview, because I think 
traditionally cosplay i think is something that you would see among uh anime characters and things from uh, japanese influences so like anime and manga if you were to dress up as someone from an anime or a manga that would almost certainly be cosplay now that it's bled into like western culture as well we've really adopted it amongst the sci-fi and marvel and comic book sort of fan areas so nowadays if you were to attend like san diego comic-con and you saw all those people in costume, even if they're not Japanese characters, that is typically going to be considered cosplay. And again, that has to do, I think, with the setting and the way that the people approach it. If you were at a Halloween party and someone was dressed like a witch uh, and you asked them, hey, is that a costume or are you doing cosplay? I think it's just up to the person to say, oh, yeah, this is like a cosplay idea that I had versus being like, I don't know what that is. I'm just a witch for Halloween. And that's Mm -hmm. great. So I think it really depends on the person's approach to it. This idea that what cosplay is and how many people are aware of it and where it sits in the culture has evolved pretty significantly. I think of cosplay as something that is really connected to the internet for me, like Mm -hmm. the evolution of that and the way people share that and all of those things. But you've been doing cosplay for a really long time. And I'm sure that within that time, it has really changed. My first introduction to it was when we were in high school. The first year I attended was 2011. Uh, We were juniors in high school. And actually, our good friend, uh, Merm, she introduced it to me because I remember her talking about how she had friends who had been going to these events, you know, talked about it like it's like, oh, it's Halloween, essentially, like you get to dress up and then go hang out and party with your friends but it's not October. And I was like, that sounds like so much fun. Like Halloween was always one of my favorite holidays because of the dress up aspect. I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but I feel like I was like a closeted theater kid. I never, (laughs) I never had the courage to actually like do theater. I tried out once and had horrible stage fright and like never really did it again. But I feel like I've always had that energy inside of me. I'm somewhat of an attention seeker. And so I'm like, I like to work hard on something and then get recognized for it. And that's something that I've always found a lot of gratitude in when it comes to costumes. When she was like, hey, so there's this event, we can make our own costumes, dress up, go hang out with people, meet new friends. Um, Because that was another big part of it is that for me, cosplay and conventions are very closely connected. And a big draw at the time was this idea that if you went to a convention, you don't have to worry about your how nerdy you are or how specific your fan interests are, because this is a place where that's the point. And so that was another exciting draw is like, oh, well, not only are we going to like dress up and have fun, but we're going to meet people who like the stuff that we like that maybe is hard to otherwise kind of know about someone unless, oh, wow, you're dressed as that character from that movie I love. We're best friends now. Let's spend the whole weekend together. That first year, my very first costume was like, I think one of the most standard things nowadays. I think I did a Harley Quinn, although my version that I did was from an animated show. It wasn't the animated series. It was a WB Kids show called The Batman, which had a younger Bruce Wayne and different takes on a lot of the Gotham characters. I really loved liked Harley's unique design in that one. She specifically, instead of just the typical kind of like little points that come off of her hat, it was a very like large structured headpiece. And I just thought that was so interesting. And so that was one of the first costumes I ever did. Looking at how I approached it then versus now, I think one thing that has always maintained the same for me that I really love is that for me, it's always been a matter of I find a character that I really like, and then I get to like be them for a little while. And at first, when I did that, like I remember I obsessively watched all the episodes that she was in. I tried to like memorize her dialogue and do her voice. And that first year was really me trying to like do kind of the play element of cosplay and be the character. Nowadays, I don't do that. Nowadays, I dress up and I go and I hang out in costume. But so that's one thing that's kind of evolved. But the main thing has always been that community that you find is always the same. And for me, my approach to choosing characters has maintained where I'm like, I always want to be someone that I'm really excited about. 
Because when someone comes up to you and talks to you about your outfit, I want to be able to respond and be like, oh, hell yeah. Do you remember episode 75 when she did this? I don't ever want to pick an outfit that is just aesthetically pleasing or of a popular character and have someone be like, oh my God, yeah, I love uh, the boys. And I'd be like, I actually hate that show, but this character is <laughs> trending right now. So I'm dressed up as her. So I would never do that. A little bit of growth that I've had from there. I think there's so many things within that that are so compelling about cosplay in general. And as somebody who has never done that, I mean, beyond like going to Halloween parties and stuff. And even then, like Piper knows because I go to Halloween parties at her house frequently. <laughs> I, I dress up. It's not great. <laughs> Especially <laughs> since Piper's Halloween parties are usually chock-a-block full of cosplayers. <laughs> and uh, frankly, I think that's cheating. <laughs> Again, I'm going to say, I firmly believe it is a rule of cosplay. There is no gatekeeping allowed. There is no quality comparison. I think the most important thing ever is to just be happy in the costume that you're wearing. And I know yeah. that's easier said than done. And there are definitely people in the cosplay community who don't follow those rules and can be quite mean. But for the most part, it's supposed to be fun. And it's supposed to be like, hey, do you love your murderous housewife outfit? Good, because you look amazing and you. you're happy and that's what matters. <laughs> I love that you remembered what my Halloween costume was last year. <laughs> Dude, of course I did. <laughs> I know that you have found this really incredible community, both in person at these conventions and my understanding is to an extent online as well. Yeah, I, I think I've been very fortunate in many of my interactions online where I have mostly just found the nice people. And those are the people that I am drawn to and that I engage with. If I've come across toxic members of communities that I'm a part of, I just kind of steer clear of it. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not for me. I'm not getting involved in online drama. I'm not getting involved in real life drama. So I've all, I've mostly just seen the good side of cosplay. I think it is uh, a hugely supportive community. I think you'll find this in many different fan environments, especially when it comes to uh, creative people who are making things. A lot of people that I engage with online with cosplay, it's a lot about showing the process of you making an outfit and people sharing tutorials with one another of, hey, did you know that if you use this technique for body paint, you can get a much better consistency so it's not so streaky? Or, hey, I don't have a lot of money to commission a big outfit, but I found a way of using you know, cardboard to make pretty realistic armor. Here's what I did. You can do the same thing. So I love the sharing aspect. I think most people in that sphere are super encouraging and supportive. It's really exciting. Now I can say this because I've been doing it for 10 years to see new people come in like younger people and see how creative they can be. And also to see people who've been doing this for way longer than I ever have, who like started back when, you know, Star Trek first began the whole like kind of fan community and people have been doing those costumes since then. It's incredible to see, you know, how they've mastered their skills throughout the years of different like fabricating techniques. Fun story. So one time I was going as a character from a uh, Adult Swim animated show that I love called The Venture Brothers, a character called Dr. Mrs. The Monarch. And she has this uh, kind of like classic superhero outfit. So she's a villain, but it's this kind of like latex sort of bodysuit that has this butterfly pattern that is sewn on the front of it. And I don't have a sewing machine. Any sewing that I do is by hand. And this was very complicated. So I was like, I cannot do this myself. I need to find some people who are expert sewers or in the very least have a sewing machine and can help me. And through my cosplay network, someone connected me with these ladies uh, that had a weekly group that they got together. They called themselves uh, uh, the Bitch and Stitch community. Oh my God. And it was so cute. And I went over to their house. I'd never met them before. And they're like, hi, like we're having pizza. Like, let's see your costume here. We can help you do that. And the one lady she had in her basement, this embroidery machine that was just running. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm making Captain America curtains. It was embroidering his shield as a little pattern. And I was like, this is incredible. So I think it's incredibly supportive. And the more I get involved with it, the 
the happier stories I gather. Well, that's so lovely. I love stories like that. And I think that that is absolutely a wonderful little thing to that I've been doing through this podcast is like discovering these little like pockets of joy and positivity and support. You mentioned those gatekeepers and we won't sit in negativity here, but I do think it's important to mention you. You've mentioned the, the idea that there are people out there in these communities, like in any fan community you find ever who are trying to gatekeep this space with cosplay there's sometimes layers of the other bigotry and upsetting shit that we see everywhere in the world in terms of like people playing characters that are not the same race as them people playing characters that are not the same gender as them not being quote unquote true to the character Mm -hmm. how have you yeah um so when it comes to that that is definitely a topic of discussion within the cosplay community i think it is for the most part Again, I think this is up to the discretion of the individual. Um, I think if you're planning to cosplay specifically someone who is a different race than yourself, you should take a lot of time to, you know, uh, research that first if you're intent on doing it and find the most respectful way to go about it. Me personally, as a white woman, if there is a character that I wanted to be that's not the same race as I am and... I, again, I think it's so sensitive. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you really need to find the right way to approach it. I personally feel like if you're doing a character that's simply like, I am me, white woman Piper, and I want to pay homage to, uh, let's say, Garnet from Steven Universe, who is typically portrayed to be a black woman. That's kind of how she looks in the mm-hmm. illustration style, even though other people might come up and say, well, technically, she's not a woman. She's a gemstone. And that's just a light projection <laughs> of her body. And also, uh, she's a cartoon and also all these other things. OK, OK, OK. So we hear that criticism, right? I personally, I don't think I would ever be Garnet because I feel like there is this kind of idea where you me as a white person a white woman have so many options of characters that i can Mm -hmm. be and a black cosplayer may feel like i don't have that many options if i want to you know look accurate and so sometimes there's this idea where it's like i'm going to sort of respect that and maybe not touch that character like i can pay homage to her and maybe just be like i'm not saying i'm garnet but i could Mm -hmm. dress as a character that's kind of inspired by garnet So it's all very iffy and you have no idea like how someone's going to respond to that. So I tend to kind of say, play it safe. I absolutely see what you're saying. I think then the flip side of that, because you are speaking from from the perspective of a white woman. So Mm -hmm. like I I can see that and that sound that kind of resonates with me, that idea that if you're going to be playing a character, think about the spaces that you're potentially taking from when that's not for you. And there are so many other things that are for you. I think the flip side of that, that I know I've heard is maybe a black woman who wants to play a traditionally white character will at times be criticized for that. I think that it is very different because in our other podcast, we've kind of talked about this idea of Um, You have to be aware of privilege. Personally, I think it's 100% acceptable for a black woman to cosplay as anybody that she wants to be. I think it changes a little bit when you're kind of, if you're a white person with privilege, kind of doing the same thing. So I. And just a note for listeners, like, I think this is an important thing to reference because it's something that I've seen and heard within the cosplay community. I follow a lot of incredible cosplayers on a lot of different platforms, and I see particularly non-white creators playing characters that are traditionally considered white, mm-hmm. and they the way that they approach that with creativity, and they create these beautiful costumes the way so many cosplayers do, and I have seen people react with a lot of negativity to that, and I don't love it. So no. we are two white women. We're not going to be able to probably (laughs) uh, unpack all of that. But I also didn't want to talk about this topic without at least addressing that elephant in the room. If you're a Black cosplayer, I think you can be whoever you want to be and absolutely should. And you're probably already doing it and rocking it. Uh, You don't need our permission. (laughs) But (laughs) I think if you are a person who comes from a, a privileged background, just be cautious, mindful and respectful if that's the path you're going to take. Yeah. And I think, yeah, just being aware of those communities that you're potentially impacting. Well, we will put in the description, and I was going to mention this 
later, but I'll go ahead and mention it now. If you're listening to this going, <laughs> amazing, diverse cosplayers, uh, yes, please. I would love to follow these people on social media. We're going to put some of our favorites in the episode description so you can go see who those people are and they can probably speak to these issues if they choose to, if that's something they choose to talk about much more articulately than Piper and I can here in this space right now. So one of the things that I happen to know you have done sort of in a similar vein of playing a character differently and interpreting characters differently than other people have is by gender bending some character. To gender bend a character is to take a character that is typically of one sex and then to do them as a different sex character. So I would actually say probably like 90% of all of my characters are gender bent because typically my process of how do I choose my next character is the first thing that I said, which is like, who's a character that I love? And then I'm like, cool, I'm going to do my own little twist on that. And so often it's like weird old bad guys. And I'm like, but what if they were a cute lady? Because I'm a cute lady and I want to be this cool old bad guy. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, my first best example of that is one of the greatest cosplays I ever did in 2012. Um, There's a fantasy film from the 80s called Legend. It's by Ridley Scott. And uh, Tim Curry plays the main antagonist in it. He's the Prince of Darkness. And he essentially is this eight foot tall devil. He's got these enormous horns, these like cloven feet. He's just red and buff and shirtless. And I love that movie and I love his performance. And so I was like, I'm going to be the lady version of him. And so I crafted the horns out of planter's foam. I attached them to a headband. I made this giant cape. I studied what kind of body paint wouldn't rub off on everything. I spent five hours painting myself in the hotel room. We finally get in the elevator. Uh, God bless my friend Haley, who has been kind of my cosplay companion from the beginning, waiting for me to get ready all that time because she's antsy and wants to get down to the con. And I'm like, I'm almost done. Help me paint my back. So five hours later, we get in the elevator and I'm jazzed because I'm like, I think I look so cool. I worked so hard on this. But I don't know how many people are going to see me and think, oh, you're Tim Curry from the 1980 fantasy film Legend. (laughs) I step off the elevator and like five minutes later, someone's like, are you that guy from Legend? And I was like, ah, yes, I am. (laughs) Thank you for knowing me. So (laughs) um, I so Tim Curry's Legend, uh, Prince of Darkness, that was my main one. Um, I also did, so I recently brought back Frollo um, from The Hunchback of Notre Dame, because who doesn't love a creepy old evil man who lusts after after a lady and then tries to burn her alive? Horrible. He's like the, for those of you who don't know the character name, he's like the evil priest man who's like somehow in charge of um, the hunchback whose name I can't remember, (laughs) which is terrible. Quasimodo. He's the man in charge of the hunchback. (laughs) he he killed his mom he took him the priest like guilted him into raising this kid and he's like what if you raised him for me i'm just gonna stop by every now and then to make sure that he hates himself yeah (laughs) it's just awful you know like Um, all the best foster parents i'm just gonna stop by every once in a while to make sure he hates himself yeah yeah. and piper was like what if he was sexy (laughs) <laughs> well, the thing is, so this is a horrible character, but I am an animation buff. I'm obsessed with the animation. His scene, Hellfire, gives me goosebumps every time. He's voiced by Tony J, and like he's just dripping with evil charm. And I'm like, ooh, you are awful, but I really like how bad you are. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to be... Like, at first time I did him, I actually tried to do the old man version, and it looked awful. So I've recently redone it as kind of like a lady version. So I've got this kind of soft uh, purple wig that has these kind of like curls that end at the shoulders. I have the hat that I made, and I just kind of pair it with this kind of long black dress. And I I just wore that one to Convergence uh, here in Minneapolis. And... I was so happy about how many people saw me and they're like, are you Frollo? Are you you the bad guy from Hunchback? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, you suck, but you look great. And I'm like, thank you. (laughs) So I've I've done that one. Um, I've done uh, Yondu from Guardians of the Galaxy. I made him into a lady. Um, I'm trying to think. I've done Tintin, who is a character from a cartoon um, that I absolutely adore that's like back from like the 40s if not earlier Uh, and I've done female Tintin because he's one of my favorites and so yeah if 
for me, gender is no object. If I see a character I like, I'm like, I want to be just like that person. So I'm going to do it. Piper can take any male character that you think is just garbage and terrible and pretty spooky scary and make them a sexy lady. (laughs) (laughs) It should be on my business cards. Yeah. So one of the questions I have within that, and someday I am going to have a drag queen on this show. It is one of my bucket list goals for this show. But how do you feel that this gender bending and cosplay alludes to or is overlapping with the culture of drag? I don't know how intelligently I can comment on that. I am an admirer of drag, spoken with anyone who has had that as an element of their life. So it's hard for me to assume the overlaps. Um, I am hesitant to compare it too much in case someone who is in the drag community might think that comparing it to cosplay is like not okay for whatever reason. But I I think one thing that I, I get from the, the drag queens that I do follow on social is that it seems to be kind of about tapping into a side of your personality um, that lets you really express yourself and really have fun. And I think that's something that both drag and cosplay have in common. And I know with drag, it's really common to do like lip sync performances and stuff like that. And I think there's an element of that that is also common within the cosplay community, not so much necessarily with like a music video or a lip sync. I mean, nowadays we have, Mm -hmm. I'm sure as we're going to talk about with like reels and TikTok, so that does kind of compare, but uh, just, you know, going out uh, in costume and like, let's say you're a bunch of Star Wars cosplayers and you're going out and you're staging like a, a force battle, you know, it's, you're, you're expressing yourself, you're having fun, and people often are excited to see you do that, and they're supporting you in those interests. And I think that's that's kind of where the joy and, and the goodness comes in for both, I would imagine. If you're somebody who has some level of open, overlapping experience with cosplay and queer culture and drag culture and sort of the way all of those things interplay, I think there's a lot of really interesting things within the idea of the role play and cosplay communities, which have overlap but are separate. There's a lot of nuances here. And this is going on the internet. People (laughs) get very protective of their thing. And I want you to know I respect your thing, even if I don't understand your thing. And a nice message to me explaining why I'm wrong about your thing is always, always appreciated. And we haven't even touched on the LARPing community, which is like, what if D&D, but cosplay, role play in the woods? <laughs> and if you don't do it in the woods, it's not real. We don't get keep cosplay, but we do get keep <laughs> LARPing, which I've never done. Have you ever done LARPing? I have not, but I definitely want to. I um, Famously once, Sam and I went for a walk. Uh, we might have actually been playing Frisbee golf, but we were walking on the Frisbee golf course in Edina. And we got there and it's like a really cool space. It takes you through the woods. It's up on these hills. And we start off and I'm just like, I'm like, I bet a bunch of lame LARPers would love to play in these woods. And by the end of the walk, I'm like, I'm that lame LARPer. I want to play in these woods. I'm like, we need to get our nerd friends out here so we can dress up as elves and run through these trees. It's me. I'm the nerd. <laughs> The nerd was in me all along. (laughs) Speaking of, I do want to do a little baby tangent because I forgot about this until you're talking about all of your experiences cosplaying. Sam is your fiance. I wonder if maybe you could share with my listeners, how'd you meet Sam? (laughs) So I met my fiance at a convention. (gasps) Um, It was the second convention. It was the year, uh, it was 2012. It was when I was doing Darkness. Although he and I actually met when I was dressed up as Princess Bubblegum from the Cartoon Network show Adventure Time. Sam had been going to con for like years. He's a, a professional photographer. He's a wedding. He was a wedding photographer for eight years. So he always has his camera with him when he's at these events. He saw me and he complimented my costume and he took my photo. Thanks to Merm, because he posted the album on Facebook. She saw it, tagged me. I started talking to Sam and the rest is history. So yeah, oh. we met because that event. Um, but I remember you telling me about that with a call when I was in college being like, I have a tea with this guy. Here's how I met him, blah, blah, blah. And you were like, he's a professional photographer. And I was like, oh, she's going to marry him probably. (laughs) Because he has a skill set that overlaps a lot with cosplay, which is photography. (laughs) The way that I always tell this story, the way that I remember it is you saying, oh, you're perfect for each other. He's a photographer and you're a narcissist. And I was like, you're right. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm like, ooh, take a picture, take a picture, take a picture. <laughs> she's a very self-aware narcissist, guys. Yeah. I just really love me. <laughs> and who wouldn't? Related to that, related to the idea of photography and how cosplay comes in, is you've talked about how kind of your way into cosplay was going to these conventions and having a space where you're with all of these people within this community. I believe like since then, you probably did this some at the beginning. You've evolved that into expressing that through a lot of different mediums, namely photography. And then as you mentioned, you do reels. Mm -hmm. Um, Guys, we're going to peer pressure into getting on TikTok as well as part of this podcast. It's a secret. (laughs) It's a secret peer pressure campaign. But (laughs) let's start with the just the joy of how you kind of create and express with these other mediums and cosplay. Yeah, so I am not on TikTok, as Lillian mentioned, um, but I have come across like so many of the like kind of classic uh, cosplay TikTok videos. And this is something that really I know, like, if you like it, then you like it. And if you don't, you see it and you're like, oh, cringe, God, please stop. (laughs) It's not for everybody because it's typically the people who are doing these things are extremely, like, heightened animation and they're moving around and bopping and making facial expressions that are like, whoa, calm down. Humans don't move like that. (laughs) At least those are the cosplay videos that I, like, was first exposed to. And there's, like, something hypnotic about it. And I also loved that it was a way to show a costume and a makeup look in motion, which I have always been like, oh yeah, I want to have photos of my cosplay so I can look back at it, share it with others. But one thing that was so exciting about that to me is you kind of going back to when I first was doing like a Harley and I was trying to be like her uh, when I was wearing the costume, I thought it was so cool that someone could take a very eccentric character and then through these videos be like, look, I know how they move and I'm kind of like them. And you're like, whoa, that's so fun and weird. And I, I want to do that too. So I started, um, I think Frollo, Lady Frollo was my first uh, reel that I made. And I just started by like taking some of the uh, songs from the Hunchback of Notre Dame and doing sort of like a lip sync with them. Um, And it's been a really fun journey of, you know, kind of it's now almost made me feel as if like I'm getting better at uh, like filmography, if that even is the word to use of like how to film stuff. Um, So I haven't yet gotten where I've like bought a stand to hold my thing or a ring light, but those are future purchases for sure. (laughs) But right now I'm working in my office. I set up my stack of books in front of my main window. I turn off the lights behind me so I have a good light source. Um, I do my makeup. I find my audio clips. I practice for like a good 15 minutes minutes. I attempt to record for a good 30 minutes. I finally settle. I edit. I put it out there. And I'm like, yeah, I hope people like this. And probably I go back and watch it more than anyone else on the internet. I'm just like every day I'm like, hmm, let's rewatch this again and again and again. Uh, but it's just really fun for me. And yeah, I, I like seeing this these characters in motion uh, in addition to just how they are when they when they just are in a photo. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think that you've been doing photo shoots of your cosplay for years, right? That's something Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned Haley as your cosplay buddy. Um, That's something that the two of you have done a lot. And I'm, I'm curious about that a bit. But I think that's such an interesting idea of being able to kind of capture them in this more alive way that you are able to almost perform when you go to conventions and things like that, and to be able to capture that to a new level. Because I have talked about going to conventions with you many times, haven't actually done it. Um, But the photography (laughs) part and doing photo shoots, I know you guys have, I've seen a lot of the photos from these. It's all part of the experience. So I was actually just talking with Haley uh, about this at Convent at convergence because she has yet to start making any kind of videos but she's an avid and talented cosplayer and so she's like oh I just don't know where to start it seems intimidating talking to her about if I do a character now with the intention of making reels this becomes an entire day I will get up I will get into the look which can take a couple of hours and then there's the rehearsal slash filming and then typically I go out somewhere like to an event or something afterwards and it's very similar with setting up like a photo shoot for me it's a huge part of the fun of the experience is getting to go out and kind of wear with the reels I talked about. It's a chance to sort of try to embody the character in motion. In the photo shoot, 
even though like you're just kind of posing, it's still really fun to kind of like scope out locations that you think would be really fitting for these characters and to try to do your best to kind of, you know, capture their their energy, their personality in the different poses and such. And it's always just a ton of fun whenever we have a group. There was a Halloween one year, and I wouldn't call this cosplay necessarily, but we decided that we wanted to all dress up as vampires. And mm-hmm. we found this abandoned uh, refinery that's just like covered in graffiti and when we were there taking pictures there were so many like teens doing parkour all over the equipment we were just like oh we're just a bunch of like crazy vampires like lurking in this old abandoned warehouse and we're like making up backstories and joking with each other we're trying to pose and be like sexy and elegant but then we start laughing and we're like you know making silly poses and i'd say for me especially sam can attest to this i'm sure half of all photos taken of me are me in like a little hunchback shape and I'm like being a weirdo (laughs) and then I'm like okay back to being an elegant gorgeous lady or trying to be one anyway (laughs) the whole experience is fun and then afterwards we have pictures that we can share with people and be like hey here's this costume and a way to remember that awesome day that we had I think we've talked a lot about that idea of creative expression as part of this and that play and the fun and the joy in the community and all of those things and there's another element that I think you and I've talked about as the idea of that confidence that you can have, and particularly in owning the sexiness of a costume and being that elegant, sexy version of yourself in this costume and how this creates almost a controlled space for that. Cosplay is a big source of confidence building for me. Uh, It is a safe space where I can explore different aspects of myself. I feel like typically the way that I interact with people in the world is I'm just like, I'm me, I'm nice, I'm a little weird. I don't want to put my weirdness out there for everyone to see until I really know you because I don't want to weird you out. I think of myself as a very professional, respectable lady. But there's definitely, you know, parts of my personality that want to be really weird, want to be viewed as sexy. My personal identity as Piper, I don't want the first thing you think about when you think of me as a person to be like, oh, Piper, she's got that awesome bod and she's super hot and sexy. That's not what I want you to think about when you think of me. I want to be known for my kindness, my creativity, my humor, uh, things like that. So, but I do also, I mean, we live in a world that makes women think you should be desired. uh, And so I definitely have those influences and I want that. But I've found for me being kind of like sexy in a costume. When you look at me at like an event and you don't know who I am, you don't know that's Piper. You're like, oh, wow, like look at that super hot, awesome babe. And I'm like, thank you. Like I worked hard on this look. I think I look hot. It makes me really happy to know that you think I look hot too. Again, it's that safe space where Mm -hmm. I'm like, they're not objectifying Piper. They're admiring Dr. Mrs. The Monarch. And I get to be a part of that. And then after that event, I can take off that costume. I rip off my wig and I'm just like a sweaty person in a bald cap. And I put on my jammies and I look through the pictures of me being pretty. And I'm like, this is so fun. I now feel like I'm totally beautiful and sexy and awesome whenever I want to be. But I don't have to be that all the time. And it's it's nice. That's one thing that I take from it. And I think that like safe space and control for people who don't have a great understanding of that. Can you describe a little bit the difference between when you're dressed in a sexy cosplay, somebody you don't know coming up to you and be like, damn, you look so good versus when you're I don't know, mm-hmm. dressed in your professional work outfit, walking to work and somebody catcalling you? Like, can you talk about the difference of those experiences and why one makes you feel good and one makes you feel objectified? Absolutely. I think it's that element of control that you kind of talked about. When I'm in this costume, that's my choice. I want people to see me that way. I want them to notice specific parts of my body. And it's okay if they do. And it's okay if they don't. When I am out in the world and that's not my goal Mm -hmm. uh, and someone does that anyway, it's almost as if like I haven't given them my consent and they're like, hey, I see you as an object and you're super banging. And I'm like, no, dude, no, I am. I'm that's not me. (laughs) Like So I think that's the difference. It gives that level of control and kind of security versus someone else kind of having that upper hand and making that decision. Yeah, I think that's an interesting way to kind of think through that idea of you are in charge of people's perception of you. Mm -hmm. And I think when 
you're walking through the world just as you, you have an idea in your head of who you are as this three-dimensional person Mm -hmm. with all of those layers that I know really, really well. And obviously you want people to know and you want people to think of versus this art that you're creating of this character where it is so separate from you. That's just such an interesting idea that I could explore just that alone for an hour. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something that I think is hard to grasp if you haven't experienced it. I know I've had like guys in my life before where I've been upset and I'm like crying and they try to comfort me and they're like, hey, don't worry, you're really pretty. And I break down even more and I'm like, no, wrong thing to say right now. It's not about how I look. It's about who I am. And it's mm-hmm. like very, very different when cosplay is so much about that's the point. Like it's mm-hmm. a, it's a visual medium, right? And it's also about the level of detail that you put into it and the way that you, you know, thought up the idea and made the costume. That when someone appreciates like how good you look in that outfit, it's not just because you happen to be born with a body that looks like this or because you go to the gym for however many hours a day to look like that, which if you do and that's your goal, awesome. But then also it's like, oh, well, I made the costume that helps add to why this looks so good. And that's something that's also being admired. And that's cool. That's something that can be true for anybody in any type of body type to be able to be like, this is me controlling how I'm being perceived. I have the ability to create this cosplay, create this version of this character that I'm going to put on externally of the the body that I happen to have. That is what people are going to perceive. And I get to decide what that is. I'm sure I know I've thought this before. I really admire your confidence and the bravery that I see in being able to kind of put on those outfits be that character and go kind of embody that and and do that in public. And I don't, I mean that in like a, that's so cool. Cause I do know that you've talked about getting those compliments and how amazing that can feel. How do you find that confidence? And are there times when you don't have it and how do you get it? I, I think a big part of it comes from, again, I've been so fortunate to have always been in these very supportive communities. I have, I think a natural confidence that Uh, I believe comes from the supportive family environment that I had when I was growing up. I mean, my parents told me I could be anything and they encouraged that until I was like much older than the age of when you're like, you can be whatever you want to be, little (laughs) kid. Like I'm like 16. They're like, remember, you can be whoever you want. And I'm like, thanks, mom and dad. (laughs) I'm going to go get my driver's license now. So I've just always had like this kind of extra confidence from that, uh, which helps. But I've absolutely had my fair share of trying to have that and then it not working. Um, The example that I can give of this was, so when I went off to college, I had made all new friends because everyone else from our core group from high school, they were at different places. And the friend group that I made in college initially, there were a few people who are absolute gems that I'm still very close with, but there was a lot of not great toxic people in those groups. One of those groups was the anime club that I was in, and we all went to this convention together. And typically, I had been to conventions before with friends that I knew and trusted, so we could dress up however we wanted, and it was always great. This is my first time doing that in a group that I wasn't that secure with. And I was doing the thing that I typically do, where I'm like, ooh, like time to get my little like shot of confidence, like let's be sexy and go have fun. And I was doing a costume that I should have, the change that I've since made to it is I now wear tights underneath this kind of like latex jumpsuit where before I didn't have that. I felt like my entire butt was just hanging out for anyone to see. And as soon as I left the hotel, I was instantly mortified and embarrassed and I felt like trash. And I quickly went back to the hotel. I felt awful. I changed out of the costume and I went around the rest of the day in just like normal clothes. So sometimes it's not there and that feeling sucks. And I know that it's very... Like the cosplay community can be unintentionally quite competitive. There are mm. so many amazingly talented, gorgeous individuals who fit a classic beauty stereotype online who are posting their looks where it's like, oh, well, I'm a cosplayer, but I actually look like Captain America. I'm that buff. <laughs> or it's like, oh, I'm a cosplayer, but I, for whatever reason, can make my tits look like Jessica Rabbit, even though that's not real. And it's just like, oh my gosh. And so it's so easy if you are a normal average person to be like, I can't look like that. Why should I even try? And the answer that I personally find is like, 
you can't think about it as a comparison because it's not about, you know, how you rank next to the other people at the con. It's about you in that moment. Is this a character that you love? Start with that because that's going to make you happy no matter what. Did you like put your own work into it? And even if you just bought it, like that's okay too. Like how excited are you about this? Because that's something that if you're feeling insecure or not like super confident, like it should be a character that can kind of build you up again and be like, oh, but I love this person. It makes me so happy whenever I watch this show or this movie and I'm now that person and that's great. And also when it comes to just like the skill level, right? I of being like, well, I my costume looks like shit because my mom helped me make it versus that guy over there who 3D printed his armor. I think then if that's your thought, you need to know that it is like with any skill or hobby, something that, you know, takes time to grow and learn the abilities to be able to do that. Because that guy with the 3D printed armor, he probably also started with the cardboard costume that his mom helped him make. And maybe if you're feeling bad, go up and talk to him because so often at cons, especially people love talking about their costumes, their process, and they're usually really encouraging. So if you were like, hey, how do I get to be that guy? Also, I want to learn how to do fiber optic cables in my gun so it lights up when I press a button. Like, you know, talk to these people. They're going to help you grow and keep going at it because it's only going to get better. Those those are my advice. <laughs> And I think that's so, so helpful for people to know and hear that you're not going to hit it out of the park every time. And Piper, that happened at least five years ago, six years ago, that you had this bad experience. And I'm sure you've had other moments of less than your most confident moment. And to be able to go, you know what, that sucked, but I'm not going to let it ruin this thing that I love that, and all this joy that I found doing it. And all of these connections in this community, like some people suck. That's true everywhere. Yes. I'm going to be who I want to be and I'm going to wear what I want to wear and finding ways to make minor adjustments so that you do feel comfortable and finding awareness of that and, and kind of getting back up and brushing yourself off and going out there and doing it again anyway. Exactly. One thing that I do want to mention that I think is is so true of kind of what you've talked about in this progress of how over time you're going to learn these skills and you've been doing this for 10 years. So anybody who goes and looks at your stuff and goes, I, well, I could never make something like that. They're just <laughs> She's been doing it for 10 years, guys. Um, mm -hmm. And I think an example of watching that progress that anyone can make with art, I think we so often talk about art of any kind as a talent versus a skill that someone is creating and building on. And I know that you and I've talked about this in drawing before where you were my art friend, like one of my art friends that I had. And I was always talking about like, I can't draw like that. And you were like, yeah, neither could I five years ago. Like, do you know how? And I, I had this moment recently that is directly related to this podcast because the amazing artwork on the cover of this podcast is done by Juan P. Cleavy. For those of you who don't know, that is Piper Cleveland, but she's the <laughs> one who who drew the art for this podcast. And that was the first time in years that I've like really looked at your art in a lot of detail beyond, oh, pretty. I really like this. I love because like I I would be thrilled of anything you did. And I know that's a flaw of my personality that I'm just a big supporter, but I this was the first time in years that I was like looking at something with a critical eye that you had done. I think the last time I remember you drawing me was in like early high school. So mm -hmm. over 10 years ago. And it turns out in those 10 years you've gotten a little better. Oh, yes, I bet. <laughs> and not to say that you were bad before. You were always my friend who could draw well. And your style has like changed a little bit, but it's similar enough that I still recognize it as Piper art. Mm -hmm. And I remember sending you a message. You sent me the first line drawing of this art. And I sent you a message back. I was like, how do my eyes look happy? How did you do that? <laughs> and I think if 10 years ago Piper saw that, she probably would have been like, I will never be able to draw like that. <laughs> but it's progress. Exactly. It is something that will you'll constantly get better at it so long as you keep trying. And that's true with so many things. Yeah, my early drawings, I keep all of my stuff. Um, so I have them in my binder. And sometimes it's fun just to look. And I'm like, oh boy, like this is my emo phase. <laughs> <laughs> and like everything is just, you know, 
bits and pieces of other stuff that I'm trying to copy and then you do it and then you you improve and then you start to find your own style and it's true with cosplay as well it's true with anything whatever you want to do start find a community that supports you because that helps so much Mm -hmm. and ask for that that feedback and that support from that community because they will give it to you and that really helps for me anyway in my experience fuel me forward yeah. of you know being able to share cosplay photos that now I look back and I'm like oh boy that was not great but the comment section are people being like oh you look awesome like I loved this show blah 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 and I'm like that said to little me I was like oh, I'm incredible I'm gonna keep going and I did and then it gets better and I just like as I know that it's always easy to look back at your stuff and you're comparing to yourself and it everybody is just a version we're all, whether it's art or something else, like we're all growing as a person. I look at some of the things that I said, motivational quotes that I put on the internet when I was 16. (laughs) Who wants to be motivated by a 16 year old? Sorry if you're a teenager listening to this, but she (laughs) was angsty. Anyway, as somebody who has known you this whole time, I think every single one that you did is better than what I would do right now. And that doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it. And I shouldn't try if I feel like that would be a fun thing for me. You have put together these things that express this internal idea of what you want this character to be. And even if it wasn't technically as great as your costumes now, I think that version of you had to be brave enough to try that. And that's incredible. Thanks. By the way, Lillian, if ever you are like, I have a costume that I want to do, I am happy to help you make it. I'll, I'll think on that. I don't, I'm already in my head like, you're not going to do that. I'm like, you don't know me. <laughs> the voice in but my head's so mean. If you don't, no worries either. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I love that idea. I've always, I've wanted to go to these conventions with you guys, mostly because I want to stand behind Sam while he takes pictures of you as people compliment you guys that just eat snacks and be like, those are my friends. <laughs> I so this was the first con that we've gone to uh, since COVID that actually felt like a convention where the last two cons that we've gone to um, since COVID times have felt very, very different. And it's, you know, everyone's masked and they're trying to be safe and their numbers are much smaller. So there's a change. And I think everyone also this is already a group of people who classically maybe aren't the best socializers. And so if you give them two years of COVID and then say, come back and be weirdos in public again, it's like, oh, I don't know what to do anymore. (laughs) Um, so it's been weird but then we went back this weekend and it felt like the old days and everyone was nice and supportive and encouraging and there were so many cool costumes i couldn't believe what people did we saw someone who because this was a um a sci-fi convention and there was a guy and he had do you know the character ralph from uh the muppets he's the dog with the floppy ears who plays the piano vaguely Okay, so he was wearing like essentially a mascot costume of Ralph, but he had the Chewbacca um, like band across his chest and he had a like Kermit the Frog Han Solo with him. And I was like, this is unbelievable. These are the crossovers (laughs) that always need to be brought into the sunshine. So thank you for coming in in public to show us your amazing ideas. You're amazing. You rock. (laughs) <laughs> people people can be great. Well, I think you've you've mentioned this a little bit. You've talked a little bit about how people can get into this. But if somebody is listening to this and they're going, whoa, I I think trying a cosplay would be really fun. What are some of the kind of very, very first steps that somebody could take to start getting into cosplay? Start with Halloween. Because like I said, it's pretty similar, if not identical to you making a costume for a Halloween party. But if you want to try and go from a Halloween costume to a cosplay, use that environment because probably, hopefully, you're going to a party with your friends. So you already have that network there of people who are going to support you and be excited about it. So I would say start with a nice, like kind of safe, fun environment where you can kind of experiment with your costumes. Then I would say like just kind of search the hashtags, like look around to see what people are creating in the fandoms that you like. Find inspiration. It can be from these unbelievably talented people, but then also like if you search a hashtag for a character on Instagram, for example, go over and click not most popular, but click on most recent and see what someone has posted in the last few days to see like who else are the other like beginners like me? What are they doing? Maybe talk to them. I find when it comes to 
looking for solutions about how to make uh, outfits if you're either on a budget or you don't know how to sew with a sewing machine like me. There are so many amazing tutorials on YouTube of different ways. Um, Hot Glue Gun is a cosplayer's best friend. You can pretty much glue anything to anything and <laughs> you'll have the start of a cosplay. So start to experiment with that. Uh, I think those are some good ways to start. Also, reach out to me. Um, if you are like, I have ideas, but I don't know what to do. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, I am just my name at Piper Cleveland. Uh, and it says right there in the top, I think, digital artist, storyteller, cosplayer. So I'm happy to chat with anyone. Uh, send me a DM and we'll talk about your cosplay goals. That was my next question, which is where can people find you on the internet? Which eventually, <laughs> one day I'll figure out how to make that not sound like either A, I'm starting to stop, start a cult about people, or B, <laughs> I'm trying to send you stalkers. So please don't actually stalk my friend, guys. <laughs> anyway, but where can they find you in a non stalkery way? I post a lot of my cosplay photos and all of my reels. You can find me on Instagram at Piper Cleveland, and Cleveland is spelled not like the city. Uh, it's C L E A V E L A N D. I also have a Twitter, which I don't update as much. Um, that's just at Piper Art C. My full name is Piper Art and Cosplay. Um, I post stuff on my DeviantArt, uh, which is Box Jelly 1. But if you were to just search Piper Cleveland DeviantArt, that would pop up. And there you can also see all my illustrations and everything. Those are the places where I'm most active when it comes to sharing uh, the cosplay work that I do. But yeah, I would love to hear from you guys. Other things that you do, if people want to, if people are looking at my lovely little face on the cover of this podcast and going, I wish I had a face that was like that for me, or if they <laughs> wanted to, I don't know, listen to you on another podcast, maybe about Jane Eyre, how could they find yeah. you then? Oh my gosh. Um, well, there uh, we have our Jane Eyre podcast. You can find us at Air Buds uh, if you want to listen to our fabulous podcast where Lillian and I talk together all the time. Yeah, my art stuff is pretty much the same as my other ones, so... Uh, okay. DeviantArt, Instagram, things like that. Uh, you yeah. can. Well, thank you so much, Fiber, for coming in and talking about this. I just had the most fun. And I think it's such a joyous space when people do something like this that they are so excited about and are creating something and being part of these communities that exist sort of all over. I think that's one of the coolest things that I'm learning about with this is how much these communities are all connected. And if you... Are, if you have a super hyper specific thing that you're excited about, I have some great news for you about the internet. It's a dark and scary place, but there's little corners of it with these shining lights of people who are excited about something. Absolutely. If you are someone who wants to know more about Care So Much, where we just find those little pockets of light and talk to people about them, you can find us at Care So Much Pod on all of the different channels. Unlike Piper, we're on TikTok. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, <laughs> everywhere <laughs> on the planet. And you can send emails, care so much pod at gmail.com. And if you are out there and there is something that you are really passionate about and you care about it so much and you could talk about it for an hour on end and you think that nobody cares, just know that I do. I care so much. I also care. <laughs>